Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of being self-motivated. With the start of 2021, we are all motivated to create healthy and productive habits that can enhance our lives. But how do we implement these healthy habits and get started? Well, it all begins by becoming self-motivated and making the decision to be disciplined enough to stick to your goals even when it feels uncomfortable. The first step is believing you are worth it. You are entitled to a life of happiness, love, health, and abundance. We are all meant to thrive and grow. So understanding this and reminding yourself that you're worth it and deserve all the effort you are putting in is essential and a motivating reminder to push through. The second step is to motivate yourself. With YouTube, it's easy to watch motivational videos anytime you want. If you ever feel stuck or unmotivated, watch a quick motivational video to reignite the fire inside you to take action on your goals. Lastly, we must make inspiring ourselves a lifestyle every day find something to be grateful for. Inspiration is all around us if we're open to it, so dwell in the unlimited possibilities that are available to you at any moment. As Brad Henry quotes, believe in yourself and the rest will fall into place. Have faith in your own abilities, work hard, and there is nothing you cannot accomplish. Next up on the show, we're in 2021. New Year's resolutions is on the top of everyone's list. So let's talk about how can people stick to their New Year's resolutions long term because you know all of us are motivated in the beginning of the year and then you know a month goes down the line and we give up resolutions are for everybody some people um they don't like that or or don't choose to want to set goals in january and that's okay but for those people that do want to set resolutions or anytime you want to set a goal for that matter um, when you break down your goal into small steps it helps to increase the likelihood that you'll progress towards your goal. Because what happens is so often our goal seems very, very daunting. And we are here and the goal is here and this gap feels really big. Mm -hmm. And so breaking it down into small steps and then celebrating the small wins along the way, that's really key. Next up on the show, we have Dr. Jillian Mandich. Jillian is a two-time TEDx speaker and the founder of the International Happiness Institute of Health Science Research, which aims to help people live their happiest lives. Dr. Jillian, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's great having you. How are you doing? Thank you. It's nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice seeing you as well. Let's dive into it and talk about your experience and your journey in getting your PhD in health science with a specialization in health promotion. So talk to us about that journey and what led you to dig deeper and you know study health and happiness. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because I study happiness now and I research happiness. My background is actually in childhood obesity. Oh, and wow. so all of my work, my master's degree is actually in child is in health science and I specialized in child and youth health. And then when I went on and I was part way through my PhD, I started looking into the literature because I've always been passionate about health and then specifically health promotion. How do we live our best life ever, right? Because we mm -hmm. get one shot at life. So how do we make it count? And I, when I was studying childhood obesity, I was using BMI as a cutoff for my research. So BMI or body mass index is calculated using weight and height. Yes. And I started thinking because people can be overweight and obese and still be healthy. And we cannot be overweight or obese and still be unhealthy. So I thought, why am I using weight as a metric when it's, the conversation is a lot bigger than that? And so I just started digging into the literature. I just went on PubMed and I was searching around reading thinking, what does the literature tell us really does matter in terms of our health? And I stumbled on happiness research. To be totally honest, I didn't even know you could study happiness. Yeah. And when I started getting into the, the research and reading things, like when you compare happy people to unhappy people, happy people are healthier. They have lower rates of cardiovascular disease. They have stronger immune systems. They heal faster from injury. They live longer. So there were so many health benefits that came from that. And so I completely switched my, my plan of research and I have never looked back because happiness is universal. Weight is out of the equation. And whether yeah. you're a child, a parent, a grandparent, anyone, mm -hmm. we all want to be happy. And as a byproduct of that, we see an improvement in our health. 
So yeah. that's what I study now and I'm, I'm very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, and as you said, you know, health and happiness is related, obviously correlated. Um, there are people that are skinny and unhappy. There are people that are obese and confident and happy. So it really, it's all in the mind, right? Of how you perceive life. So I really like that you touched base that it's, you know, it's not necessarily your weight or this or that, but it's, you know, you're also your mindset. And, and I love that you're studying that. I want to talk about, you're the founder of the International Happiness Institute of Health Science Research. So let's talk about that, how you created that. It, it sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, when I first was on my, my path, I was following the traditional academic path where you get your PhD and then you become pre professor. And I started teaching, I, was, I did all my work at Western University in London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And partway through, I started doing a lot of media and interviews because I felt it was really important to take research and make it applicable and relevant in real life. Right, because what good is it if we read these journals and, mm -hmm. and just read it and it doesn't actually make meaningful change or impact the lives of people in a positive way. And so I started doing a lot of speaking and media and, and teaching outside of the walls of a university in order to take the research and everything that I'm learning but bring it into real world. And so after I graduated my PhD, I decided that I'd rather start a private company where I can go into schools, into mm. businesses, into not-for-profits, uh, into private consulting, all sorts of different things where you can take research but then make it useful in real life, apply all the rigor and the data and the best knowledge and information and evidence from science with real world life. And so that's what I do now all the time uh, and it really, I feel like it's a really good marriage of, of my two passions and interests. Yeah. And what's been some of the research that you have found um, with health and happiness and achieving that? Well, actually, uh, one of the studies that I just uh, did, completed last year um, with a colleague of mine, Dr. Ramit Billen, in partnership with the Canadian Mental Health Association, we looked at happiness and mental health in the workplace. So we actually did a national study. We had over 11,000, or 1,100, pardon me, Canadians mm -hmm. respond to our study in January and February, looking at the state of the workplace, mental health in the workplace. And we had a big plan to release all that data in March and then COVID hit. And so mm -hmm. the landscape has changed quite a bit since then. But what's really interesting is that we were actually able to have a snapshot mm -hmm. of the Canadian landscape at work right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so this is really interesting data because things weren't looking that good then. Issues like communication, commutes mm -hmm. came up, um, flexibility. And so all of these things, we saw that they were a problem. And then it's interesting to observe how the landscape is changing now. And what we're really looking forward to is looking um, in a little bit to see comparing before and after and, and what we might find. Mm -hmm. And you know, with co I feel like mental health is such an important topic. It's, you know, people don't talk about it as much. It's obviously coming to the forefront more now, but it's such an important topic, especially right now with COVID. Um, people's mental health is not, are not doing that well because, you know, they're isolated and, um, you know, a lot of the blues going on right now. So how can people preserve their mental health right now during the pandemic and just in general, you know? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, I was talking about how earlier my, my PhD is in health science and health promotion. Mm -hmm. So before the pandemic, I, whenever I was doing a keynote or a talk or a workshop, I would generally start with explaining why happiness matters and how it impacts our health. Mm -hmm. And since COVID has hit, I haven't really had to have that conversation because mm -hmm. now all of us, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our colleagues are living and breathing what it's like to experience a lot more mental health challenges than we have seen in the past. And we are, according to the Canadian Mental Health Association, seeing elevated levels of stress, of anxiety. So it is a very real thing for a lot of Canadians. And in terms of preserving it, I think part of it is that the conversation around mental health is much more normalized now than it has ever been. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and at the same time, what has happened in the past year is we're starting to see more resources available, more things openly talked about, more people that aren't okay, instead mm. of saying, I'm fine, how are you? Mm. Expressing how they feel. And so I do believe that that is a silver lining that we have seen this past year is that we are starting to have more open and honest and real conversations mm. about mental health so that that's the first step, right? We have to reach out and to share in order to get tools and resources and support or to process things. So that, that I would say is one of the silver linings from this year.
Yeah, I think that's really important. Just asking people, are you okay? I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday and I had asked her that and she said, no, not really. You know, I feel like this or that. And we had this open discussion and it was it was really healthy and it was really nice to speak to someone about that and for them to be vulnerable and actually talk about how they feel. And I think that's really important is that opening up that dialogue and talking about that. So I 100% yeah. agree with you. I want to talk about what are some tips and tricks that people can use to fight the blues? Because of course we're based in Canada and we have winters here which adds yeah. to the blues you know so so what are some tips that people can take away from this I think uh, first of all to know that the goal is not to be happy all the time yeah uh, you know I'm a happiness researcher I am not happy all the time and I wouldn't want you to be or my friends or my family are you watching uh, so number one is take the pressure off yourself to know that if you're not feeling happy and bright and shiny and positive and joyful that's okay we need highs we need lows that full spectrum of human emotion is what it's like to be human so I think that's first and foremost to know that it's okay to not be okay uh, and then if we're looking at things to instantly shift our mood exercise moving our body is really one of the actually one of the leading happiness researchers uh, she says that happiness is the most effective instant mood booster because we start to feel when we move our body with that shift in our mood and I think uh, given we're in Canada and we always want to hibernate in the winter, this is something to continue to remind ourselves whether it's having a dance party in your house or doing something if we don't want to go outside or bundling up and going for a walk, moving our bodies is really, really in a key piece. The other thing, and actually um, a study that I did at Western uh, for my PhD, I taught students a variety of different tools and strategies to increase happiness because there is a large piece of our happiness that's actually within our control, above our genetics and above our environment. And I asked them at the end, what was your favorite thing you learned? And mm -hmm. by far the number one skill or tool that they learned was gratitude. Mm -hmm. So taking time every single day to think about or in a best case scenario to write down things that we are grateful for and I love this because it takes what like two minutes to do it doesn't require any tools or resources besides a piece of paper or an app on your phone and gratitude and happiness are really highly correlated and this is something that it's small changes over time but they are very meaningful in terms of their impact mm -hmm. I love that you said that you know you, people that are happy doesn't necessarily mean that they're happy all the time. I think that's really important for viewers watching this. It's like, yeah. you don't have to be happy all the time. It's okay to honor if you're not, you know, you're not that happy or you're angry or whatever that feeling is. I think it's important to honor that. But, you know, obviously the goal is happiness, but I think that's important for people to know. You don't have to be happy all the time. It's okay. None of us are all the time, you know. And I love that you mentioned gratitude as well because I am a firm believer of gratitude. Um, I write affirmations and just reading them just in the beginning of my day make me it, it just kind of infuses so much happiness in me and I just feel a lot more alive and happy so I really like that you know of course we're in 2021 New Year's resolutions is on the top of everyone's list so let's talk about how can people stick to their New Year's resolutions long term because you know all of us are motivated in the beginning of the year and then you know a month goes down the line and we give up. So what are some tips and tricks to, you know, continue being motivated, especially during this pandemic, which makes it a little bit extra hard? It, it really does. And I think that's an important thing to remember, right? We are living um, in very unprecedented times. So giving ourselves a break uh, and resolutions are for everybody. Some people, um, they don't like that or, or don't choose to want to set goals in January and that's okay. But for those people that do want to set resolutions or anytime you want to set a goal for that matter, um, when you break down your goal into small steps, it helps to increase the likelihood that you'll progress towards your goal. Because what happens is so often our goal seems very, very daunting. And we are here and the goal is here and this gap feels really big. Mm -hmm. And so breaking it down into small steps and then celebrating the small wins along the way, that's really key. The other piece in particular with New Year's resolutions, um, a recent study came out and found that when we find joy or pleasure from our goals, we're a lot more likely to stick to them as opposed to focusing on what we can't have or are missing out on or can't do. So say for example, you wanna reduce your sugar intake this year. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, I can't have any candy, I can't have this, focusing on, I get to have three servings of fruit today, right? Because maybe that's your healthier substitute of sugar. So instead of focusing on what you're removing or not doing, finding a way to spin it into that positive, that's a really key piece in terms of adherence for a resolution.
Mm -hmm. I, I think that's great advice, you know, honoring and celebrating the little wins because I think a lot of the time we just look at the end goal and we, we're not necessarily thinking about how far we've come. So mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important advice. I want to talk about you a little bit because you obviously have a very impressive background. You have a PhD. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some milestones in your career and that you've had so far. Yeah, you know, um, what is really fascinating is, you know, when you look back and you're, you're so happy where you are, but you never planned it. Like, it's not like when I sat down in high school, I told my guidance counselor, when I grow up, I want to study happiness. Yeah. And and actually, it's interesting because a lot of times when I tell people I'm a happiness researcher, they'll kind of like tilt their head and get this like confused look. And I know that they're thinking, is that a real thing? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And yet when I was an obesity researcher, there was no questions. And I think that it, it's really an emerging field. Um, the field of positive psychology and health science and specifically the study of happiness has seen a huge increase in the past five, 10 years in terms of the, uh, the amount of work that's published in the scientific community as well. I mean, there's even a happiness section now if we go into a bookstore when we can go to bookstores. Um, and I think that the work is really exciting because I have been able to take my passion for health and wellness. And all three of my degrees are in health science and health promotion has always been my area of focus. And to be able to take that and to share with people meaningful things that can actually make a difference, not only even how we're feeling in the minute, in the moment, but how we relate to other people. Happiness is, it really impacts things in the workplace, our cooperation, how our problem solving, our likability with other people, mm -hmm. our relationships, our marriages, our friendships. Um, so to take one thing and to be able to have the opportunity to talk about it from an evidence-based perspective, I just feel so grateful um, mm -hmm. to be here and to be able to do it on a, on a variety of platforms, you know, um, writing, reading, media, having conversations with you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really, it's really fun. Yeah. And how can people stay connected to the community um, and avoid that isolation feeling? Because, of course, that comes with just feeling really negative and alone. Uh, for a lot of people, they're living by themselves or they're not able to speak with family and friends. So how can people, you know, connect with the community um, if they're not working or they're isolated right now? I love that you brought this up because this is a really, really important thing always and in particular right now because we aren't even going outside for walks and stuff as much right now. Yeah. We're hibernating inside and, and research shows that loneliness can be as detrimental to our health as alcoholism or smoking. Mm -hmm. So it feels horrible when you're feeling lonely, absolutely, but the effects are very significant even in terms of our health. So knowing that, it's a good reminder to really prioritize that feeling of connection. And, and it can be hard sometimes because when we're feeling lonely or isolated, it's almost counterintuitive. Like that's the time we need to reach out the most mm -hmm. and yet the time when we're least likely to. Mm -hmm. So bringing up these things, reminding ourselves, this isn't just about how we're feeling, it's about our physical health. And yes, we need to get creative with connection right now. We have to be on, on Skype or mm -hmm. on Zoom or on FaceTime or different things, but it's, it's really key to find at least one or two people that you can reach out to that can you can connect with and they can connect with you to have those conversations like we talked about earlier beyond hey how are you i'm fine you know mm -hmm. when we're not okay having that person you can call and and cry or vent or feel sad and if you also like the canadian mental health association has really amazing resources uh social media can be a great tool i mean yes mm -hmm. uh, i feel like social media has it has its strengths and its weaknesses, but one of the strengths really is this opportunity to connect with like-minded people anywhere in the world. So uh, myself, for example, I, am, I have taken up jigsaw puzzling wow. oh, through, since COVID. I've become an avid jigsaw puzzler. And so I joined a Facebook group where people talk about puzzles. Yeah. And so this is a great tool for me to be able to share and to have that connection with uh, people. So finding interest that you have, places where those people are, reaching out and connecting, uh, really, really key. Yeah. And I want to ask you, what did you learn about yourself during this pandemic? Because I feel like everyone's learned something about themselves that they didn't know before. Um, mm. So what's something you learned? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that I've really learned is uh, when everything happened, my schedule that was very, I had a very full schedule, a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking, uh, and it all came to a halt in one yeah. day. Mm. And I realized that a lot of times our schedule is filled with things that keep us busy, but in terms of 
of where I'm going and what is my priority. There was a lot of stuff that was a gray area there. And mm -hmm. so really what this has done is it snapped into focus for me, getting clear on what my priorities are. And then asking myself the questions of, is this moving me towards that? Or is this something that's, I have like sparkly key syndrome sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like, where yeah. everything is fun and I wanna do everything. And mm -hmm. I've, I've really come to realize that when we like trim away some of those things that are not moving us towards our what our ultimate goals are it gives us more time for that and so that's been something for me that I really feel um, has been a great learning is just recognizing what's important what do I value where do I want to choose to get my time and to eliminate some of the other uh, peripheral stuff yeah I think that's great yeah. is the cutting down the things that aren't that important and that's why i like to start my day with all the priorities first and everything i need to accomplish i get all the right stuff done first in my day which i think is is really important i know that you have a variety of services as well so let's talk about those things yeah and actually um one of the things that's interesting is i have become so good at doing webinars and tech uh -huh. on my computer yes. that i never have before so i i'm doing right now i think especially because like we, we talked about mental health and happiness and resilience are such important topics to be talking about, especially right now. Um, I am, ex my schedule is extremely full doing a lot of virtual events, virtual mm. keynotes, virtual webinars, virtual workshops um, with a lot of different companies and organizations really focusing on how can we take the science of happiness and bring it into our workplace and that virtual workplace there's those added challenges to to actually take research and the best available evidence and use it to make people's lives better right now so i i'm doing a lot of that work right now i also am involved in an amazing project at sick kids called mm -hmm. meant to prevent which is a type 2 diabetes uh prevention program for kids and families so essentially it's all healthy living resources that are vetted by doctors and nurses from all 13 of canada's children's hospitals mm -hmm. and uh so i am virtual working on that project as well and i am in theory working on my book <laughs> oh nice <laughs> so nice. i uh i i have always planned to publish my PhD as a book. And so uh, I've been procrastinating that successfully for a year now. So I decided <laughs> 2021 is the year to stop that procrastination and to start working on that. So that's what's gonna hopefully, will keep me busy uh, yeah. in the next few months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Lynn, let's talk about your book a little bit. What can people expect and what are the topics that would be discussed? Yeah, well, so when I was writing my PhD, like just to be totally honest, it's not a fun experience, right? And yeah. it's, it's very long and you write this thing. I think my dissertation was like four or 500 pages. Like it's very long. Yeah. A lot of it's like references and appendices. At mm -hmm. the same time, uh, what I realized was I have all this great information. I have the best available research of all the literature out there on happiness right now. Mm -hmm. So I thought what I want to do, and academic writing, the other, the other challenge is that it's very prescriptive and it, it can be very boring uh, where it's, it's it's not flowery it's not fun it's not exciting it's very much uh, a formula that you follow and so my goal was always to how can I take all this amazing information and I poured five years into working on a PhD mm -hmm. how can I take that now and make it accessible and make it useful and so my goal with my book is to find a way to take all of that research and information and put it into a very user-friendly book where my my challenge is right now to be totally honest is that every single person what makes us happy is different mm. and not only that but what, throughout our life right like what made you happy when you were three or four or 20 right is different than now and so how do i write a book telling people how to be happy when it changes all the time and it's different for other people mm -hmm. and the other piece is if i really stop and think about it i find the idea of me telling somebody how to be happy as disempowering yeah. because happiness comes from within Right. And yes, I can share information and knowledge and resources and you can take that and process that and integrate that however you want. At the end of the day, in order to have meaningful change, it really needs to come from you first. So how do I create a book that isn't like a how to or me telling somebody, but finding a way to be able to empower people to do the work for themselves? Because one of the like when as soon as I tell somebody I'm a happiness researcher, the number one thing I get asked is, OK, what's the magic pill? Right? Like, yeah. what's the, the one thing that I need to do or buy or get or say in order to be happy? When in reality, there's no magic pill. And that that's just the reality. We have to do the work. It takes work and it takes practice. And we can use science to sort of move the compass in the most effective way to navigate us. But at the end of the day, if we want to be happy, it really does a lot of it come down to us and our thoughts and our actions and our behaviors. And that's the piece 
where we can have meaningful impact beyond genetics and environment, of course, but if we're just looking personally within. So mm -hmm. that's what's all going on in my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I'm going to like definitely read that book and I I'll really send you a copy as soon as it's done. <laughs> yes, 100%. And you know, you know, last but not least, I want to ask you, what makes you happy? I know for me, what makes me happy is progress. If I see any progress in my career, with my relationships, it makes me happy. Even a small amount of progress is something that I really look forward to. And if I don't have progress, then I'm not as happy as I usually am. So for, what's something that makes you happy? I love that. I can relate to the progress thing too. And, and I love that you even asked this question because so often when I'm doing a research study, if I'm doing like focus groups or interviews with participants, I'll ask what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll get one of two answers. One, like a blank stare. Mm -hmm. Or two, like without even taking a breath, I'll get my friends, my family, my dog, my cat. Yeah. And like an, an almost like spontaneous answer. Yeah. And a lot of times, and then I'll ask the second question, well, are you as happy as you possibly could be? Mm -hmm. And then they'll say no. And I thought about it. I'm like, well, you don't know what makes you happy. No wonder you're not happy. So yeah. asking this question, what makes you happy is a really, really key question for all of us. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously I've asked myself this question many times. And <laughs> so for me, I, and I also know that research shows that it's the small moments of joy or happiness throughout the day that actually add up to a happier life than those big shiny moments. Because yeah. even though we think about those, the weddings, birthdays, holiday celebrations, graduations, it takes up a lot more mental real estate. But in terms of actual time, it's the small joys day to day that we really get the most bang for our buck, the most impact. And so for me, when I think about what are those joys for me, it's having coffee with my boyfriend every morning. It's mm -hmm. going outside for a walk. It's taking time at the end of the day to work on a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's those activities when I notice that I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is sometimes it's just about removing things too, right? We don't always have to add things. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, you know, being very conscious about how much news I'm consuming, mm -hmm. being conscious about the people that I am talking to, what I'm reading, who I'm following on social media, all of those things, removing or deleting or filtering mm -hmm. also make me happy. Yeah, I think that's great, especially that you mentioned all experiences, not things, because sometimes mm -hmm. people think that things are going to make them happy, a new house, new car a new whatever, but really at the end of the day, it's the experiences that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. So I completely agree with that. Where can people connect with you on social media as well as just connect with you in general and maybe use some of your services? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my website is my name, jillianmanage.com and my social handle on all the socials is at jillianmanage. So uh, those are both great places uh, to find and connect with me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Jillian, for being on the show today. It's been very insightful. And of Thank course, you. all the best for 2021. And we hope to have you on the show again. Hopefully in person soon. Yes. <laughs> In person yes. will be best and hopefully that will happen later in the year. So thank you so much. Thank you. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.